All right, if I can have your attention, I think it's 7.30. So time for us to try and start with the second session. This is the first time that uh, we have tried to do two sessions like this with a meal in between. Um, I hope that you enjoy it especially the meal portion of it. But I hope that the Bible prophecy portion is uh, exciting for you also. The, there will be a meal uh, each night when we are together. We are going to be together on Thursdays, Saturdays, and Tuesdays. A total of 10 nights we will be together. So there is still time for you to bring someone else. As you see, there are a few uh, empty chairs close by, and uh, there are some brochures there on the table, and we encourage you to invite someone to come Saturday night when we have a couple more presentations ready for you. And another meal. There you go, an amen for the meal. Yeah, that's the good part, isn't it? Before we begin this uh, second session, uh, this presentation, uh, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Once more, Lord, I, uh, we bow our heads, we pause to acknowledge you as our creator God and to recognize that we can do nothing without you. We need the Holy Spirit here with us to lead us and to guide us into all truth. So we ask, Lord, again, for your presence to be here. I ask that you would uh, guide my lips. I pray that you would be with our ears as we hear what is said. I pray that uh, you would give us clear minds with good understanding. Because we are your children and we desire to understand Bible prophecy even better than we do now. Grow us to be more like you, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Someone uh, told me when I was walking around during the meal that I forgot to introduce myself at the beginning of the first session. My name is Dale Tunnell. I get the privilege of pastoring this church. Uh, we have some student pastors here, and they are our normal presenters for this session, but uh, somehow... They did not get assigned this session, and so it fell into my lap, and uh, I apologize for that. The student pastors seem to do really good with this and uh, have put lots of energy into it, so hopefully you'll get by with me all right, but the student pastors are much better, much better, so make sure you're here the, the other nights when they get an opportunity to present. Most of you know World War II began September 1, 1939, when Germany invaded Poland. Two days later, Britain, France, declared war on Germany. Ten days later, Canada joined the World War II. It took another two years before the United States joined, and we know how that came about. December 7, 1941. Two U.S. Army privates were manning a mobile radar station there on the Hawaiian island of Oahu. They saw something on the radar screen that would turn out to be absolutely disastrous. Japanese warplanes were headed towards Oahu. The attack resulted in 2,400 American service personnel being killed, 3,350 American planes being destroyed, or badly damaged, and 18 ships being lost. More than 1,100 died in the USS Arizona was sunk. It was a colossal tragedy, and it didn't have to be. It could have been different. Concerned by what they saw, those two privates contacted their superiors at Fort Shafter, and they were told that what they saw was nothing to worry about. 
they were told that what they had seen was American planes on maneuvers, probably flying from the deck of the aircraft carrier. At 7.45 a.m., the two privates had heard what they had been told, and they went for breakfast. What they had seen on their screen disappeared because the planes were so close to the island at that time. At 7.53, eight minutes after the men went for breakfast, the first bombs began to rain down on Pearl Harbor. Carnage, death, destruction, chaos. The greatest tragedy, however, is that for an hour, a solid hour, there was clear, inescapable, irrefutable evidence of what was about to take place. The radar had given them the evidence. The signs were screaming out that death was coming. But it was ignored. Does that ever happen today? In our world? In our society? Do we ever ignore the signs? God's word, the Bible, the one that you can trust. You learned that in the first session, right? Not Hillary. Not Donald. God's word is the one that you can trust. God's word is what we can rely on. But God's word clearly indicates that the end of the world is near. The signs are there that Jesus is coming soon. Jesus was talking with his disciples. And his disciples asked him the question, What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? They wanted to know exactly what was going to happen. They wanted to know when he was going to come. And we want to know also. Matthew chapter 24. Jesus outlines more than 20 signs to let individuals know when he is going to return. He said to his disciples, as he overlooked Jerusalem. He said, one day Roman soldiers will come and destroy the city. Not one stone left upon another. Can you imagine the shock that was to them as they looked at Jerusalem, the city that they loved, as they looked at the Temple Mount, and they heard Jesus say, not one stone left upon another? It happened. A.D. 70, Roman general Titus devastated the city of Jerusalem exactly as Jesus predicted it was going to happen. The Roman armies burned the city, leveled it, like Jesus said was going to happen. The disciples understood Jesus' words. They thought the event, the catastrophic event of the destruction of Jerusalem was going to be when Jesus would return. And they were looking for him. But they saw the signs. They saw the signs of what Jesus said. And when Titus surrounded the city of Jerusalem, they knew what was going on. And when Titus miraculously pulled away the Christians in the city of Jerusalem all vacated the city because of what Jesus had told them. It is said that at the destruction of Jerusalem, not one Christian died because they were following the words of Jesus. Jesus' words can be trusted. In a masterful presentation, Jesus blended together the two events, the destruction of Jerusalem and the signs of his coming. He wanted them to know what was going to happen. He told them about signs in religion. He told them about signs in the world of politics. 
He told them about things that were going to happen in nature. He told them about signs that were going to happen in society. He wanted his disciples to know what was going to take place. Leading up to the destruction of Jerusalem, but on a larger, grander scale, leading up to his return. When he was going to come again and collect his disciples, his followers. The dis- question that the disciples asked, when will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Is a similar question that we ask today. Wanting to know, Jesus, when are you going to come again? Jesus gave some signs in the world of religion. Jesus said there would be false Christ and false prophets. Matthew 24, 24. False Christ and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders. Before the coming of Christ, we should expect an explosion of interest in false religions. Do we see that today? False religions are rising everywhere. The occult world. Do we see an interest in the occult? What is happening today is exactly what Jesus predicted is going to happen. I mean, in the United States of America, we say that we are, are a Christian country. And yet, at the end of this month, the largest sales of any holiday takes place in the United States. Think about that. This month, we as Christians like to think that it might happen in December. But this month, what takes place the end of this month? We would like to say that it was Reformation Day, wouldn't we? But yet is the interest in the occult world that takes place at the end of this month. In the United States, during the last decade, the number of people who identified themselves as belonging to the New Age movement increased 247%, according to the American Religious Identity Survey. Wow. A Christian nation, are we? The modern occult, Wiccan, pagan, and druid religion is now listed among the top ten largest organized religions in the country. Did you read this last week of what is happening in Oregon? Christians were trying to get into the school system there. Instead, the satanic group is also making inroads into the school system, saying, hey, if you're going to let Christians have after-school meetings, you have to let us have after-school meetings also. Who would have ever thought that was going to take place? We should expect an explosion of interest in various religions. We should expect false Christ and false prophets to be coming forward because it is exactly what Jesus said was going to happen in the last days. Jesus predicted that these kind of teachers would arise. The question, though, is, are counterfeits easy to spot? I mean, some of these false teachers teach things that are contrary to God's word. But yet we learn that God's word is what we can trust. If God's word is what we can trust, where should we be looking for answers? We need to be looking to God's word. The Bible teaches that evil spirits can perform miracles. So, Having a miracle performed isn't good enough. When a miracle happens, we know that it is of other origin. We do not know if it's divine or satanic. We simply know that it is supernatural. 
We can't trust our senses. We can't trust the things that we hear, the things that we feel, the things that we see. We have to rely on God's word. Revelation 16, 14 says, For they are spirits of demons performing signs, which go out to the kings of the earth and to the whole world, to gather them together, to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Do you see what it says? Spirits of demons performing signs? Who can you trust? Just because someone can stand up front and, and, and talks well, just because someone can make a good presentation, just because someone performs a miracle, doesn't mean that you can trust them. You can trust God's word. That's where we need to be looking for answers. When the prophets step forward, they don't hold up a sign that says false prophet. Have you seen that on anyone's name tag? Ever? Anywhere? No one has a name card like that, do they? When's the last time you saw a fake $13 bill? Why do you not see a fake $13 bill? Well, yeah, because the moment you saw one with the 13 on it, you would know that it was fake. Don't you love it every time you take the $20 bill and you give it to somebody? They always hold it up to the light or put the marker on it. Or you hand them a $50 bill and they say, sorry, we don't accept these. You give them a $100 bill and they don't know what to do with it. Really inspect it closely. They're worried about the counterfeit. How do we know? if it's in a counterfeit Christ or a counterfeit prophet. It's not if they work miracles. It's whether or not they follow what God's word says. We need to beware if any religious teacher leads us astray from the Bible. I encourage you to take notes. We encourage you to write things down. We encourage you to ask questions. We encourage you to, to go home and to look at the, the, the Bible and to, to make sure that what is presented night after night is accurate. We want you to be like, like the Bereans who listened to what Paul had to say, heard what he said, but studied the scriptures to make sure that he was sharing what was correct. We encourage you to be Bereans, to study God's word. That's why night after night, we will put the text on the screen, but we encourage you to write it down, to open your Bibles. You'll notice that we, we didn't hand out a, a Bible for everyone to use. We didn't want you to get confused. by. We wanted you to be able to look it up in your Bible, so you get comfortable in your Bible. And that you can go home and you can say, hey, yeah, exactly what they are saying night after night is coming from God's word. It's saying exactly what scripture teaches. We want you to find out that you can trust God's word. Books on the occult, magazines, movies on the occult are selling in the multi-millions and the TV programs are coming out, more and more of them. A book that was out just a few years ago, Angels of Deceit, outlines the many religious deceptions that people are falling for today, the counterfeits that are leading people away from God's word. Do you remember some of them? A while ago, 1997, 39 members of Heaven's Gate cult committed suicide, following their leader, Marshall Applewhite. They were looking for the flying saucer that was just behind the tail of the Hale-Bot comet. Do you remember that? 
just a few years ago. Maybe some of you don't remember it. You can go and, and look it up. They asked for people to call in if you thought your child was part of a cult. Just after that suicide, they were trying to identify all the bodies, and they got 1,500 calls from people that said, asking, is my child part of that? The cult world is growing. You can find them everywhere. They were worried about their children. 1970s, Jim Jones captured the world's attention. He led 913 members of the People's Temple into a deception. The interesting thing about it was, was he had gotten lots of awards from the government. Walter Mondale, the vice president of the United States, had visited Jones's church, had made a presentation there, had told people how wonderful Jim Jones was. But then Jim Jones led his people to Diana, where they drank the Kool-Aid, committing suicide. David Koresh had some strange teachings from the book of Revelation. The cult leader believed that it was okay for him to take any woman he wanted there in the cult as his spiritual wife. Many people followed him, but they were deceived. Some of us remember what it was like watching on the TV and hearing the cry that came forth. Oh, they're killing themselves. Do you remember that cry? False Christ, false prophets. According to the website, cultclinic.org, an estimated 5 to 7 million Americans have been involved in cults or cult-like groups. I'm going to tell you they don't hold up a sign that says false prophet. But there is a way for you to check and see if they do not speak according to God's word. Study God's word and compare what it says. The total number of these groups ranges from three to 5,000, approximately 180,000 new cult recruits every year. It's big business, a sign of our times. Jesus said there was going to be false religious revivals. People would be interested in religious things. False teachers would arise leading people away from what God's word says. But at the end, there is going to be an even greater one. Revelation chapter 13, verses 13 and 14, says that he performs great signs so that he makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast. The signs Jesus gave in the realm of religion is going to get even greater. It's going to be fulfilled before our eyes. He is going to do signs to try and deceive even the very elect. Now, if you see the sign, what do you know? You know that it is supernatural. That's what you know. Can you trust what you see? Can you trust what you hear? Can you trust the way your feelings feel? That's why Jesus said, don't even go out into the desert to see if they say that the Christ is out there. Don't go into the inner chamber if they say the Christ is there. Because you can't trust your senses. Fire coming down from heaven to deceive those who dwell on the earth. Remember in the Old Testament, when fire came down in the days of Elijah, consumed up the altar that was there on Mount Carmel? That was proof that the Creator God was the Creator, that Jehovah was the Creator. 
when that fire comes down at the end, what does it prove? You can't always trust your senses, can you? We have to test and see, are they teaching what is according to God's word? Notice Revelation 13 there says, He performs great signs so that even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast. The false Christs and false prophets, while we see a few of them prior to now, it's going to get worse. Jesus said there will be signs in the world of politics. He discussed international conflicts. He predicted that in the last days there were going to be wars and rumors of wars. We like to say, but war is just a a way of life. Scripture talks about wars all the time taking place. But Jesus said there were going to be wars and rumors of wars, plural. What do we see today? International conflicts on a global scale. Not just a single war taking place here and taking place there, but wars that are taking place everywhere. Matthew 24, 7 says, Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. When Jesus predicted it was not the, a single war taking place, but multiple wars. 20th century, World War I, World War II, 180 million deaths from war alone. Those were big wars, weren't they? What have we seen since? Vietnam War, the Korean War. Indochina War, Iran-Iraq War, Middle East conflicts, tribal wars. And do we even go further, the war on drugs and the war on terror? Where do those take us today? What part of the world? Everywhere. The war on terror. The terrorists have taken the battle to the streets. Bali, Spain, London, New York. We don't know where it's going to be next, do we? Chattanooga, Tennessee, last year. Where will the war of terror strike next? Jesus is the Prince of Peace. He is the one that can give us true peace. He told us there were going to be wars and rumors of wars. Fragile peace agreements. The Bible predicts that the human attempts to achieve peace would fail. Paul describes it this way in Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. When they say peace and safety... Then sudden destruction comes upon them, and they shall not escape. Have we heard the term peace and safety before? How many times have we heard about peace treaties signed in the Middle East between the Arabs and the Israelis? How many times? Seems like every time a president gets to an end of a term, he wants to make sure that he gets that treaty signed. Doesn't care what he takes. But all it takes is one terrorist to go against that. One person to strike a match. One person to throw a bomb out. And the treaty is null and void. And it goes back to the way it was. When they say that there's peace and safety, sudden destruction can come. 
Where do we find peace and safety? Only in Jesus. Only in Jesus. We see these prophecies being fulfilled before our eyes. All the best efforts of the United Nations failed to give us peace. What God's word says is so accurate. Jesus could come in our time period. The potential today for world destruction. Is it possible for the world to be destroyed today? Revelation chapter 11 verse 18 says, The nations are angry. Your wrath has come. And the time of the dead that they should be judged and that you should reward your servants, the prophets, and the saints. And those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. When Jesus gives out his reward, he comes at a time when the human race has the capacity to destroy the earth. Did humanity have that capacity a hundred years ago? Do we have that capacity today with our nuclear weapons that we're getting rid of? Aren't we getting rid of our nuclear weapons? We keep saying it's going to happen. We keep saying we're cutting down. But yet, it doesn't take place. Time Magazine ran an article, oh, it was several years ago, about the fall of the Soviet Union and what took place when there, no one was in charge of their military. 60 Minutes ran a broadcast about Russia's secret cities, 10 cities there in Russia that they, plutonium, enough plutonium for one bomb that could be produced every three days in those cities. You talk about things that the terrorists want to get a hold of. That had some concern for the rest of the world. The eyes of the world today are on North Korea. Fearful of what is going to take place. Fearful of the weapons of mass destruction that they have. Do you see why we think that the footsteps of Jesus, you can almost hear them? can almost hear the trumpet sounding, the voice of the archangel. The signs of the times are all around us. Luke 21, 26 says, Men's hearts failing them for fear, and the expectations of those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven will be shaken. Are men's hearts failing them today? Do we kind of live and wonder what's going to happen next? When's the next big catastrophic event going to take place? Exactly what is it going to be? We live in a, in a day and age where we have a lot of fear and apprehension. What's going to happen next? The signs in the religious world, the signs in the world of politics, what about what Jesus said about famine? Matthew 24, 7, there will be famines, pestilence, and earthquakes in various places. People say, but haven't we always had famine? We can open the Bible in Genesis, and it talks about a famine here and a famine there. Haven't there always been hungry people? Once again, Jesus used the word famines, plural. United Nations report, 38 of the major countries in the world have severe food shortage. How are we going to take care of the severe food shortage? One-sixth of the world's population goes to bed hungry tonight. Now you can look at some of the billboards around Chattanooga, and it says one in five children in Chattanooga will go to bed hungry tonight. You will not. 
right? You got a pretty good meal. Experts say that 3 billion people in the world today are starving. Jesus' prediction regarding famine is true today. One-sixth of the world suffering famine. 10,000 people per day, 3.5 million per year dying of starvation. We say that there's more and more food, but it feeds less and less. Do we like to hear about people starving to death? The population of the world growing, but much of our, our agricultural land that we could be producing food, we're not. I mean, even here in the United States, our government is paying people not to farm their land. Wouldn't you like to get in on that? You didn't want to farm anyway. Just buy a piece of land and say, I'm not going to farm it. And the U.S. government will pay you not to farm it. That way you don't have to buy tractors or combines or any of that stuff. Isn't that a sweet deal? And yet, more and more of our land is not being used to produce the food it could produce and more and more people are starving. Over 100,000 square kilometers of arable land are lost each year. Jesus said that there would be famine. He said that there would be pestilences. He says there will be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in various places. Now, what is a pestilence? It's a strong, dis strange disease which affects human beings crops, the environment. Are we seeing that today? Matthew 24 said it was going to happen. The prophecy is being fulfilled. You've heard about the, the resistance of crops, the reason farmers are spreading the pesticides on crops. They're trying to get rid of the disease. They're trying to get rid of the pestilences those things that are killing the crops. If they spray more and spray more and spray more, then the food will be healthier? Or will it? Pestilences are spreading rapidly around the world. Another form of pestilences are new diseases that are springing up around the world. Some examples of that are the mad cow disease, bird flu, HIV AIDS, Marburg, Lyme disease. All around us we see the prophecies of Scripture being fulfilled. Famines and pestilences are being fulfilled in our day. 2.4 billion pounds of toxic pollutants cause an estimated 50 to 120,000 premature deaths each year. Which one of those things that they're spraying to protect the crops from pestilences are we allergic to? Probably some of us are allergic to all of them. A combination of us are allergic to all of those things. Our oceans, our forests are rapidly being destroyed, trying to protect ourselves from pestilences because of the new toxic chemicals that are being produced to destroy them. No more than one of a few decades remain before the chance to avert the new threats we now confront will be lost and the prospects of humanity immeasurably diminished. Jesus gives us the signs. He told us the signs in the world of nature, of things that were going to happen, that nature was going to be out of control. He said that there would be earthquakes in various places. Are there earthquakes in various places today? They seem to happen everywhere. 
Revelation chapter 6, 14 tells us of a greater earthquake that's going to happen even yet to come. When the sky is going to recede as the scroll, when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake. Such a mighty and great earthquake as has not occurred since men were on the earth. The greatest earthquake yet to occur is still future. But what about these previous ones that we see? These earthquakes that are happening, that are taking place. Earthquakes are growing more and more frequent, it seems. 2010, we had an earthquake of seven or greater on the Richter scale, one every 15 days. That's fairly regular, isn't it? I went back to try and check since then, and I checked some other extra ones. 2014, we had 145 earthquakes on the world that were over the six on the Richter scale in 2014. In 2015, we had only 25 that were over 6.5 on the Richter scale. You go to look up worldearthquakes.com and you can check it out. How many each year? It seems like it just keeps getting more and more all the time. Stronger and stronger. And they keep saying the big one is coming. Revelation predicts an even bigger one coming that is going to move the mountains and the islands. Luke 21 says there will be great earthquakes in various places and famines and pestilences and there will be fearful sights and great signs from the heavens. Upheaval in nature is going to occur. Men's hearts failing them for fear and expectations of those things which are coming on the earth. Are we prepared for our hearts to fail? Do we see what is happening with tornadoes, hurricanes? Earthquakes, famines, fires, floods, the natural disasters that seem to take place, resulting in billions of dollars of damage. Even here in Hamilton County, the fire last week. Think of it. Everywhere. People trying to hold on to their children. Afraid of what's going to happen next. Last week, we were worried about the hurricane that was coming up the coast. 1990s, we were looking at the major tsunamis in the world. Well, that's a number of them. Did you know that there were that many in the 90s? The Asian tsunami, 2004, December 26. And thousands lost their life. 230,000 people killed because of the earthquake and the tsunami that took place? Do we see these kind of catastrophes happening in greater and greater frequency? Hundreds of thousands being left homeless? The relief efforts cannot keep up. We can't get enough supplies to Haiti fast enough for the people that were hurt in the hurricane last week. The Bible des describes these events taking place, one event after another after another. In 2005, they say it was the most costliest uh, hurricane ever, over $75 billion worth of damage, which caused an economic impact of $250, million, $250 billion because of what happened there. The signs are everywhere. Do we see them taking place over and over and over again? People are ready to cry out with the disciple John, O oh Jesus, come quickly. Hearts indeed are failing for fear. Not just the upheaval in nature, but in our society. Look at the predictions that this Bible gives to us about the moral decay that is going to take place. 
Matthew 24, Jesus said, But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. Is there anything wrong with eating and drinking? Is there anything wrong with marrying and being given in marriage? Except that they took it to excess and they forgot their creator God. They were focusing upon the pleasure of their lives. They ignored the signs. Noah proclaimed that a flood was coming. Noah pointed out the moral decay that was taking place in the world. Do we see it today in our society? The breakup of the family unit? The complacent attitude towards spiritual things? Millions that are turning away from God's word and going towards occult practices? Their attitude towards moral living? Births to unmarried women? This is just here in the United States. Last 40 years keeps going up dramatically. 50 to 75% of all marriages ending in divorce. The rate is high as 75% in some countries. 2005 U.S. Census says 50.3% of households are headed by unmarried people. 46.9% of people over age 15 are unmarried. 31.7% of children live in unmarried households. What's that say about the society in which we live? The biblical model for the family has been shattered by our society. These prophecies are being fulfilled before our eyes. Our society is becoming an immoral society. I should not say becoming an immoral. Is an immoral society. The society in which we live is anything but following what God's word says. But we shouldn't be surprised. Jesus said it was going to happen. The social fabric of our society, of what God wants, is falling apart. We live in a world where crime and violence is on the increase. Genesis described it. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of men was great on the earth, and that every intent and thought of his heart was only evil continually. That was the days of Noah. Could it be describing our day just as easily? What is our society like today? Sexual immorality on television, magazines, movies, the internet? Murder happening? Directed at the police? Is our society evil continually? The Bible says the Lord saw what he had made on the earth and he was grieved in his heart. What do you think he thinks today when he looks down and sees us? Continues in Genesis 6, the earth also was corrupt before God. The earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth and indeed it was corrupt for all the flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. In Noah's day, God destroyed the world with a flood because it was filled with violence, because their heart was evil continually. Are we seeing that today? Is our government concerned about this today? Do we have an answer today? The World Health Organization did a report on violence in 2002, the first time they had focused on violence. And when they focused on that, the World Health Organization was supposed to be focusing on health. Why would it focus on violence? Because violence has an impact on health. Each year, more than 1.6 million people worldwide lose their lives to violence. Many more are injured and suffer from a range of physical, sexual, reproductive, and mental health problems. Violence is among the leading cause of death for people aged 15 to 44 years worldwide. 
accounting for about 14% of deaths among males and 7% of deaths among females. Do those statistics surprise you? Children watch an average of three hours of TV a day. By age 12, they've seen 14,000 murders on TV. There are increases of violence, foul language, sexual content. It seems to just get worse and worse all the time. What about our economy? Do we see signs in the economy of what is happening? James chapter 5 says, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches and are corrupted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasures in the last days. Indeed, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, cry out, and the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of the Sabaoth. You have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury. You have fattened your hearts as in a day of slaughter. For in one hour such great riches come to nothing, Revelation says. Aren't we glad that James was talking to the rich? That's not us, is it? There's an interesting website that you can go to and you can find out how rich are you. I'd encourage you to go and find out how rich are you. Do you realize if you make $30,000 a year, that's not much. But if you make $30,000 a year, you're in the top 10% in the world? We don't think that's rich, do we? If you make $60,000 a year, you're in the top 2% in the world. I sure am glad Paul was talking to somebody else, not us. And he talks to the rich. He says, your wealth is going to corrupt you. Revelation 18 says, For in one hour such great riches come to nothing. We can't trust our money. It is going to fail us. The signs all say Jesus is coming again soon. The prophecies are being fulfilled before our eyes. False Christs and false prophets. Wars and rumors of war. Cries of peace but no peace. Famines and pestilence. Earthquakes. Sexual immorality. Homes falling apart. Violence filling our lands. Economic uncertainty. All prove that Jesus is coming soon. But there are two more signs also. Knowledge is going to increase. Daniel 12, 4 says, But you, Daniel, shut up the words, seal the book until the time of the end, when many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Knowledge will increase, it says, at the time of the end. Anyone who thinks that knowledge has not increased recently has been sleeping through what we know as the computer age. 90% of all scientists and technicians that have ever lived on Earth's history are alive today. Is knowledge increasing today? Every time you click on the computer, you go to the Internet, knowledge is increasing. The explosion of knowledge. Too much information that we don't know who we can trust. Isn't that right? That's why we learned in session one, we can trust God's word. That's what we need to go back to. And it's okay if you find it on the internet, but God's word is where the truth is. Daniel 12, 4, knowledge shall increase.
the knowledge that increases is not just knowledge of internet use and that kind of thing, but knowledge of spiritual knowledge, the gospel going to the world. Just before Jesus returns, it says, this gospel of the kingdom is to go into all the world. Every kingdom needs to hear it. It's going to be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations. And then the end will come. Revelation 14, 6 puts it this way. I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. The gospel is to go to everyone, everywhere. When you see the gospel going around the world quickly, you know that Jesus is doing something, that he is going to return soon. God is on the move today. He is going everywhere. He is seeking to let the people know that he is coming again. You can go to the Philippines. Thousands accepting Jesus Christ there in the Philippines. You can go to Africa. Many of the African countries right now, they are having a modern day revival taking place in those countries. They accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. They follow him in baptism. Former communist countries. A few years ago, we used to talk about the Soviet Union. Similar thing is taking place in Cuba right now. That former communist country, or I should say that communist country, but it's kind of opening up right now to the gospel. Missionaries are free to go in and to to share the good news of Jesus Christ. You can go to India today. Hindu country. Look at what is happening in India. You go to the Muslim countries and see what is happening there in those Muslim countries. Many of them are believing in Jesus Christ, accepting Jesus Christ as the Messiah. Whoever thought that was going to happen? I know you did. Because you read it. This gospel of the kingdom must be preached where? In a whole world. As a witness to all nations. God is on the move today. The message is here. It's clear for all of us. Daniel says it. Jesus said it. Revelation says it. More than 100 years ago, the greatest ship sailed from Southampton, New England, bound for New York City. Largest ship in the water, said to be the safest, unsinkable. But we know what happens to the Titanic. It now sits thousands of, I should say, hundreds of feet below sea level south of Nova Scotia. It sits there because it hit an iceberg. What we often forget is that this White Star Line ship was, that was sailing got nine messages that there were icebergs in the area. Nine messages received and understood. Now, if you've got nine messages received and understood, don't you think you would do something? Today, Nova Scotia is filled with dead individuals in their cemeteries because of what happened on the Titanic that night. Bodies that had been recovered from the Titanic. More recently, a cruise ship off the coast of Concordia was wrecked off a small Italian island. It ran over a rock, had a 160-foot gash in the hull, causing the ship to take on water and tip onto its side and essentially sink, similar to what happened to the Titanic. They thought that they were safe. It won't sink. 
a number of people that lost their lives there in that tragedy. But that ship encountered a rock. The people on board were unaware of the danger. In fact, when they knew that it was an emergency, they were told that there was just an electrical problem. So they went on and joined the crew's amenities. Friends, the signs are all around us. Jesus is coming soon. What's it going to take for us to wake up? What's it going to take for us to say, we want to be ready for Jesus when he comes? What's it going to take for us to, to get excited about this and go out and tell somebody, Jesus is coming soon? Okay, four of you heard me. Jesus is coming soon. Do we really believe it? The signs are all there. And yet, we go on and join the amenities of our cruise ship. Instead of preparing ourselves, instead of warning others, friends, Jesus is coming soon. Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, you give us warning, ample warning. We can see all around us that the signs are here, Lord. We see them in society. We see them in nature. We see them in the government. We see them everywhere, Lord. We know that you are coming soon. I ask, Lord, one, that you would help us to be ready, that you would open our eyes, give us understanding so that we can see what is happening and we can understand what is taking place. Two, Lord, that you would give us a zeal, an excitement, a desire to go and share with others this good news that you are coming soon. Lord, don't, help, don't let us be lulled to sleep. Don't let us think that it's just a blip on the radar screen and go about our regular business and go off and eat breakfast. Don't let us go along with the amenities of the cruise ship, Lord. Please wake us up. I pray this in Jesus' name. Friends, Jesus is coming soon. Take one of these brochures, Which Way America? Invite somebody else to come here Saturday night. We got more good news that we want to share from God's word. His word is sure. The prophecies are sure. You can believe it. Invite somebody to come with you Saturday night. Thank you for being here this evening, and God bless you, and good night.